zeroing in on zebrafish. Dr. Michelle Collins takes us inside her lab, and we look at the connections between zebrafish hearts and human hearts, and at genetic mutations that could explain why some children are likely to land in the hospital with aggressive heart arrhythmias. We do think there are some of these ion channels that connect between these neighboring cells to propagate this electrical information across the whole heart that seem to be misregulated or mislocalized. And so we're currently exploring that right now. Dr. Michelle Collins is our guest today on Researchers Under the Scope. Jen Cannell, and today we are looking at the heart and what makes it tick in both small humans and in even smaller zebrafish. We're talking with Dr. Michelle Collins, an assistant professor in the University of Saskatchewan's Department of Anatomy, Physiology, and Pharmacology. Now, back in October, she offered to give me a tour of her lab. Hello, Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jen. All right, let's go in. Come on in. All right, and here we are in the microscope room. To me, this looks like, okay, it's almost got like binoculars to look in. Yeah, it sits it, on this um, pretty fancy table, which is called an air table. This minimizes any sort of vibrations from the floor or from touching the table so that your samples stay immobilized on, on the stage here. Okay, and so what can we look at? So I prepared some samples for us. So here, what I've prepared for us is a little dish, and we've got two different zebrafish embryos in there. These guys are about five days old. Okay. Um, and you they're can see- They're so tiny. They're, they're tinier than like a, the smallest earring I've ever had. Yeah. They're, they're like little teeny tiny type tadpoles, really. Half a really. centimeter, yeah. Yeah, they're just, I can just see them. Right. <laughs> so okay. what we can do is put them on the microscope and we can take a look at what we have here. So. Our microscope has got this stage, and we put our samples in here. So are those little zebrafish are embedded in a gel or an agar agarose pad. This means that they're kind of immobilized, so we're not going to run into them. You know, they're not going to swim away from, from Yeah, I was, I was wondering how they would stay in there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And if they would be afraid of the microscope? I have so many questions well, you know for you, zebrafish. <laughs> They're actually pretty happy in there, and they'll recover. So you can cut them out, and they'll swim out, and then they'll live happily ever after. And so next to the big microscope, there's a computer with a pretty big widescreen. This must be where we actually see the images that the microscope is producing. Exactly. A lot of what we, to use the microscope, actually, what you do is control a lot of it from this software here. So instead of fiddling with all of the, the parts that you see here, we, we actually do a lot of it from the computer. So I'm going to put this onto a live view here. It's black and white. It's a, like a big, long portrait-sized rectangle on the screen. And it looks like, is that the zebrafish it's heart? The zebrafish heart. So I'm just going to focus it up a little bit more so we can see what we're looking at a little bit more beautifully. There we go. OK. So this is a zebrafish heart. So it's a little bit different from a human heart. You have just a single atrium and a single ventricle. So these are the two chambers. In humans, you have two atrium and two ventricles. Yeah, this looks a little bit more simple. Yeah, exactly. But you can see the blood cells, so these dark cells moving through our blood cells. Um, and you can see the heart pump. And this particular example, I hope you can see, see sometimes the heart pauses. Yeah. So it's not beating very rhythmically. So this is a mutant that we have that um, has cardiac arrhythmia, right? So oh, the heart just really pauses, right? It, it pauses and like you see the blood cells sort of fill up, fill up, and then they finally and get then back to they where they need to go. And then they go right on, yeah. So that's one of the phenotypes or traits that we study in the lab. And one of the other really cool things about zebrafish is that they're great to use in drug screens. And so what you can do is take a disease model, treat it with drugs, and figure out what drugs could potentially be alleviating some of the phenotypes that the disease model shows. And that's one of the projects that we're working on. A couple of the students are currently interested in now is what can we add to this to try to diminish these uh, arrhythmic events. 
We do think there are some of these ion channels that connect between these neighboring cells to propagate this electrical information across the whole heart that seem to be misregulated or mislocalized. And so we're currently exploring that right now. And this is all happening in real time. This is. This is this is the beating heart of the fish. So a zebrafish heart. So your heart, my heart beats around, let's say, 60 to 90 beats per minute. And a mouse heart would be 300 to 500 beats per minute. And a zebrafish heart is about 180 beats per minute. Okay. Um, you can see when it has this sort of stutter or these pauses that the heart rate slows down. Um, but yeah, this is... So let me take this guy to our next sample here. So this transgenic line in the vasculature, we wouldn't necessarily use for looking at heart function as much, but we have different ones that light up in the heart. And I'm actually, if I go back up here, I could switch. This, this is so cool because inside the zebrafish, there are these little white powders. Oh, look, so what's, now, it's like a little volcano. Yeah, so this is a transgenic line. Again, this is just the same fish. But now it carries a second transgene that's expressed in the heart. So in the movie we saw before, this was just bright light, just regular white light. Now we can see, so here's the atrium and the ventricle, and this transgene is um, localized specifically to the muscle. So you see these muscle fibers contract as the heart pumps and relax. So this kind of a transgenic line we would look at in our mutants and we would ask, okay, how does the cardiac muscle look like? Um, how is the organization of these cells? Is there any morphological changes? So structurally, do they look different? Um, and then our different biosensors we can use to measure how calcium is actually moving in and out of the cells. This zebrafish you said is five days old. Yeah. So how does that change over the lifespan of That's a zebrafish? That's a great question. That's a great question, yeah. So um, in the model that we have, we start to see some early changes in the developing heart that just get worse as the fish ages. And so we have fish that are, you know, a year and a half old. They look pretty good. But then if you do things like an echocardiography on them or an, uh, an ECG, um, you start to see that the heart chambers aren't really contracting properly. They're very arrhythmic um, and they really model what a person that has something like atrial fibrillation would be experiencing later on in life. Dr. Collins then showed me where the zebrafish live. So we're gonna head down another set of elevators to the basement, the lab animal services unit. And this is where our zebrafish are housed. All right, so there's a number of different um, animal models that are housed here uh, that are researchers across the health sciences department or the health sciences building will use. It almost looks like storage lockers. <laughs> you should come on the weekend when there's no lights and it's just a red uh, glowing light. <laughs> Much creepier. Here we are. This is so this is a bit of a louder room. These are a lot of the fish tanks that we have that house the fish that we use for our different research. And you can see this is what the adult zebra fish look like. Um, quite a bit larger. They have the, you know, the zebra stripes on their side. We also have some of these lines that you can see here. So these guys are white. They're actually transparent. Um, they're called this Casper, like the friendly ghost. <laughs> a lot of biologists have a really good sense of humor. Um, <laughs> so these Casper fish are really cool because the skin is transparent, so we can actually look at a lot of organs easily because they lack pigment oh, in the adult okay. skin. Yeah. So Casper is useful to look for. Exactly. <laughs> you can look through them. This is an example of a breeding tank. So you've got two parts here. You've got this inside insert with these it's like, like a, a strainer at the bottom. Yeah, exactly. And then it sits inside. And so this is a, a male here. So I can tell he's a male because he's a bit reddish in color and his body's a bit more flat. And we would set him up with a female. In the morning when the lights come on, the, they would lay embryos. And we would collect them under here so that they get their, they go underneath this strainer and then the adults don't eat them. Do they sometimes eat the yeah. embryos? Yeah, they're a nutritious food source. Well, I guess everyone gets hungry on a date. <laughs> right. Okay, so mental note, zebrafish dates, they're a lot weirder than I expected.
Back in Michelle Collins' office, I asked her how she got interested in zebrafish and in science in the first place. Yeah, no, I think like probably many other scientists that you've interviewed, uh, I was really interested in science growing up as a child. One of the first Christmas presents I remember was, you know, a chemistry set and a small little microscope. And I remember my grandparents gave me this book of home experiments that you could do. And it had these um, little packages of agar gel that you could melt. And so we melted these dishes. Um, and we, my mom and I tried to take swabs of my sister's uh, mouths and the dog's mouth to see what would grow on these agar plates. And so that was, I think, my science fair project in grade four. Um, and then in high school, I had some really great science teachers that really helped propel me into scientific research. And I had one in particular who had set up this co-op program where in grade 12 and grade 13, I was able to go into the University of Western Ontario. So I'm from London. Yeah. Um, and so at the university, I worked in the lab of Dr. John Trevithick, and he was in the biochemistry department. And that's where I got my first taste of, of lab research. And I ended up staying in that lab for the four years of my undergrad as well as a, as a volunteer. So yeah. what were you doing in there? It was <laughs> so the first projects that I did took, tested the antioxidant activity of different herbal remedies. And so we would take these compounds up, grind them up, and we would I learned how to pipette and design controls and all of this stuff. And then the other projects looked at the antioxidant activity of beer and wine. But I was underage at the time, so I wasn't actually able to handle those samples. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I could just enter the data in the computer. But it, it was a, definitely a, a good experience. Oh, oh wait, wait. Are there antioxidants there are, in beer yeah. and wine? <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure that study was sponsored by Labatt. But, <laughs> but there's definitely, especially stouts and, and like Guinness, have a lot more antioxidant activity. Red wine also. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead there. But from there, what was it that pushed you through even to, to grad studies and then to postdoc work? Yeah. So I, I had a lot of opportunities to do lab research when I was at Western. So I worked in that biochemistry lab. I then did a fourth year honors project at the Children's Hospital Research Institute. And I got really into developmental biology. And so I decided then to do a master's in developmental biology, so studying, you know, how organs form and, you know, what are the cues that make us, you know, a fertilized embryo all the way uh, into an adult form. And so I decided to move to McGill for my master's, and then I switched into a PhD program there because um, I loved the project that I was working on, and I really enjoyed working with my supervisor. And then when I was getting close to the end of my master, uh, my, my PhD, I decided you know, I wanted to stay in academia, and I wanted to pick up a certain set of new skills that would allow me to, you know, develop my own research career. And so I decided to move to Germany then for my postdoctoral work. What did your postdoc work focus on? Um, so my postdoc work, I had originally started working on some developmental questions. So how does the heart become positioned on the left side of the body? It's one of the only organs, actually, that is asymmetrically formed. Yeah. I became interested in a particular transcription factor called PIDX2 that controls a lot of this. But then the research started to kind of develop. And so PIDX2 is also important um, in humans with a disease called atrial fibrillation. This is a cardiac arrhythmia where the heart doesn't beat um, in like a steady pattern? That's right. Yeah. In like an unsteady or a weird irregular pattern? Right. So you end up having a bit higher heart rate in the atrium and you have irregular pauses. There. Okay. And so you're trying to get to the root of how, how did the heart grow that way? Yeah, exactly. And how did that transcription factor cause or lead to the disease? Okay. That takes you from Germany all the way back across the Atlantic Ocean. Right. <laughs> Eventually you land here at the University of Saskatchewan. Yeah. Uh, what drew you here? So my whole goal the whole way through was to come back to Canada. I mean, I loved living in Germany. It was a fantastic experience, but I really wanted to come back home. Um, and so when I was entering the job market, I started applying everywhere. <laughs> everywhere in Canada, there was a position. And I came here for an interview. I came in February of 2020, so it was very cold. <laughs> oh, and just, and just before, before COVID. The <laughs> oh. And I really, I, I thought the city was fantastic, even though it was, you know, frigid at that time. Oh. Um, the department was very welcoming and supportive, and I think they really, you know, support new faculty. I could envision a lot of collaborations with my colleagues here. And I think most importantly was the fact that the students, the graduate students that I met, were 
happy, they were enthusiastic about their work, and I think that speaks a lot about the environment of research here. They want to be here. They want to be here, yeah. And they're supported and they're excited, and that's what I want trainees in my lab to have. One of the things that I wanted to do was develop collaborations with clinicians who were interested in finding new genes that are linked to either congenital heart disease, so diseases that happen when the heart doesn't form properly in babies or in children, and new genes that are involved in cardiac arrhythmia, so when that heart doesn't beat correctly. You and your team are working with this grant of about what $180,000 that came from NSERC, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research mm -hmm. Council of Canada. And what can that microscope help you answer? Right. So I think, so my research program has got two different axes. So we've got this health science axis that is like projects that I collaborate with, with Teresa on and other health related ones. Yep. And then the NSERC project looks more at the fundamental mechanisms of how does a heart muscle cell, a cardiomyocyte, beat? And how does it coordinate with its neighbors to make sure that the whole heart contracts together? Oh. So what we do with our microscope is... Um, a lot of imaging. So we take our zebrafish, which is our favorite model organism, and we either delete genes or we add them back in, or we look at how different cells and tissues are responding to different drugs. And then we can get a lot of information by just watching these models under the microscope. Okay, how comparable, though, are tiny little zebrafish to, like, human hearts? <laughs> it's funny, right? They're Even small, small human hearts, fish, like pediatric right? ones. <laughs> yeah, so the, these zebrafish are these small, you know, a few centimeter long fish. And, of course, you think, how similar can they be to human hearts? But actually, they are quite similar. And a lot of people have done a lot of great modeling of cardiovascular diseases using zebrafish. So from a genetic standpoint, a lot of the genes that make our hearts form during development are the same ones at play in a zebrafish heart. From a physiology standpoint, a lot of the things that make your heart beat, so the channels and the ions that, that work, are functioning the same way in a zebrafish heart. And so you can make a lot of, we have a lot of different tools that we can generate in zebrafish that will allow us to study the functions of genes and channels and so on in, in human hearts, but in an easier model. I had never thought that a fish heart would be so close to my own. <laughs> <laughs> but I, so far, what have you figured out? Yeah, so so a lot of this work that is encompassed in the Answer Project, I started as a postdoctoral fellow. And so I was interested in, in this uh, group of ion channels. So these are, are channels that sit in the membrane of a cell that regulate how different ions go in and out of a cell. And so this is really central to how to, the heart pumps. One of the major ions that's involved in, in cardiac function is calcium. Okay. And so calcium moves in and out of the cell to make the heart pump. The calcium dynamics, though, have to be very tightly regulated. So calcium can't just be swimming around the cell. It needs to be sequestered into what are called organelles. So little, let's imagine them as like little stores throughout the cell. Okay. The major one in cardiac muscle is card called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But the ion channels that I became interested in weren't found there. They were actually found in another organelle called the endosomes and the lysosomes. And so one of the earlier experiments that we did was to test, like, if you block these channels, what happens to the heart rate? And it seemed to really slow down heart rate and create these arrhythmic hearts, suggesting that these channels and potentially these organelles could be important stores of calcium in a contracting cardiac muscle cell. And so what we're doing now is generating genetic mutants for the genes that encode these ion channels. We've developed um, a biosensor line. So basically, this is a genetically encoded fluorescent biosensor that would fluoresce green when calcium is moving around. Oh, okay. When calcium is trying to get through the channels right. it needs to get through, it exactly. would fluoresce green. Yeah. And so we can, we can use that to figure out how is this calcium moving? How are these channels potentially coordinating this movement? And before that, you mentioned you also have to create basically the right team of zebrafish. Right. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> And how how do these particular zebrafish, I'm guessing they're kept in their own special tank, yep. and, um, how do you make sure that they have the right genetic modifications? Right, so, so um, a lot of your listeners might be familiar with this technology called CRISPR-Cas9. And so we can use the same technology in zebrafish. So what we do is we, we, say, we target a particular gene of interest, and we use CRISPR-Cas9 to essentially cut that gene out or make little deletions in that gene, so if you don't have that gene product anymore, 
what is the consequence on, on cardiac function? Mm. Once you've been able to figure out some of these ion channels a little bit better and what affects the calcium, what doesn't, where does that take us down the road? Yeah, so this is something that I think fits into our broader understanding of how, how does the heart muscle cell work? Right? How is this coordinated between neighboring cells? And I think we'll, we'll hopefully discover some of the basic mechanisms or fundamental mechanisms of that. It would be really cool to then tie this back to the health science aspect of my research program, right? Do patients with mutations in these genes exhibit cardiac arrhythmias? Or can we use these new genes that we've identified to then screen patients and figure out if this could be an underlying cause of their cardiac arrhythmia? How would that work? So, so we, once we've kind of pinpointed down the genes that we're interested in, you could go back and sequence patients. There's also a number of uh, genetic databases that you can look at to try to figure out if there are mutations that are picked up in other patient populations. Uh, okay, so the, seeing the same thing but replicated. Right. Ooh, well, I'm wishing you luck with it. Thank, Thank you, you so much for this. <laughs> this is a lot of fun. Dr. Michelle Collins is an assistant professor of anatomy, physiology, and pharmacology at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine. To see more of her work, go to medicine.usask.ca. Researchers Under the Scope is a presentation of the Office of the Vice Dean of Research at the U of S College of Medicine. We record and produce this podcast on Treaty 6 territory, and we pay our respect to the Métis and First Nations ancestors of this place. We reaffirm our relationship with one another. And we'd sure like to thank you for tuning in. I'm Jen Cannell, and we release a new episode of Researchers Under the Scope every two weeks. Find those three little dots in the corner and hit follow so you can stay up to date.